Champions League, group stages here. Week one was absolutely incredible. And the US men's national team players as well, kind of contrasting fortunes for a lot of those guys. So let's break it all down. Nick Mandola, first week of the Champions League group stage, we had upsets, we had drama, we had a lot of goals, 28 uh, on one match day alone. What did we learn uh, from the opening week of the Champions League action for you? What was your main takeaway? Yeah, uh, my main takeaway is I have to be careful not to overreact because when the games are as th- when the games are as thrilling as they are, right? Like that's the thing. The Manchester United game was fun because they were on the back foot, and ultimately, a couple days removed, you just think to yourself, "Well, yeah, but they were down a man, and this is Europe. This is you know, young boys might be from Switzerland, but um, not every team is is Man City who can go down a man and." and have a system of, of complete thing. And we've talked about Man United's lack of a system before. Yet at the same time, I think to myself, yeah, they were down a man. They were down a man <laughs> in, in a very big situation. And then, you know, Man City, oh, they, you know, they gave up three goals. Well, they were probably playing a little bit looser than usual, and they scored six, right? So I think my main takeaway is to take a deep breath and recognize that this is six games. And unless you're in a very jam-packed group, the odds are that you're going to be okay. That said... Isn't it tempting, Joe, to talk about what happens if United is buzzing atop the Premier League table but flames out in the group stage again? It is. And obviously it was, you know, for three wins and one defeat for the Premier League teams in the Champions League. So United lost at Young Boys 2-1, last minute winner uh, for Young Boys. Incredible scenes there for David Wagner and uh, on that artificial pitch, which I know Man United weren't too happy uh, about playing up, but Ronaldo scored again for them. Um, But yeah, that was a real shock. And obviously, Chelsea took care of business against Zenit. Liverpool beat AC Milan in a thriller as they came back at Anfield. And then Man City just played a wild game with Leipzig in that 6-3 victory. So a decent start overall uh, for the Premier League teams. Andy, what was your main takeaway? What did you uh, enjoy from the first week of group stage action? Yeah, I felt like the Premier League teams came ready for business right from the start. And obviously Manchester United had the setback, but I feel like without the red card, in some way they end up winning that game late on there in Switzerland. And so we're talking probably about a 4-0 run for the Premier League team. So it feels like um, how how well some of these teams have started the Premier League season is carrying over to the Continental competition, which doesn't always happen. So it's nice to see that. Sometimes, like Nick, I think, referred to there, you'll get a team struggle in the league and do real well continentally or vice Mm -hmm. versa. So I, I think those four teams have put down a marker and said, we're four of the maybe six or seven teams to beat. Uh, it probably will make up half of the quarterfinals this season, I would guess, by the time we get to that point of the competition. So uh, I'll put a pin in that, and, and we can come back to it maybe after a couple of more rounds of the group stage. But my biggest takeaway was Barcelona. The, <laughs> wow. Wow. That was – it was startling to watch Barcelona – completely unable to perform the most basic of footballing tasks on the field with Bayern Munich. They were, so, they were, I think Barcelona were about seventh best in that game against, against Bayern Munich. That's how bad they were with just two teams on the field. I don't know if this is going to be a permanent thing for Barcelona until they can get things figured out financially and get that club back on solid footing once again, but that was shocking to see. And I know it's an extreme example because it's Bayern Munich and they're one of the maybe two or three teams outside the Premier League clubs that could win the Champions League this season. But that was just, it was jarring from what we've come to know of Barcelona over the years during our lifetimes to then see that it was lifeless. Lifeless is the best word I can think to describe that uh, non-performance from them against Bayern. Yeah, 3-0 hammering at home against Bayern Munich. And obviously fans were back in the new camp for the Champions League game. A lot of excitement there. And a lot of those fans were leaving early, leaving their seats and just getting out and, and leaving. But rather than witness that, and obviously a huge summer of upheaval with Lionel Messi leaving, all the other financial problems... A lot of new players as well, so maybe it will take a little time for them to gel. But yeah, big problems there for Barcelona and for Paris Saint-Germain. They didn't have a great start either. Club Bruges, they drew away there. And Club Bruges were unlucky not to win that game. And Messi had a few good moments, hit the bar, uh, was marked pretty closely. But he he started up top with Neymar and Mbappe, the dream team. It didn't quite work. They were all trying to get on the ball in similar areas. They were... Um, Of course, that chemistry hasn't a chance to build yet. Neymar and Messi, though, they go way back, so there shouldn't be a problem there for them. But 
PSG just looked a little bit imbalanced. And that's what we were worried about, right, guys? But almost, you know, <laughs> the Monstars kind of Space Jam situation, put all the, the great players together. How are they going to be a team and a cohesive unit under Maurizio Pochettino, who loves to press high and has a very clear identity? Just didn't see them doing that against Club Bruges. And uh, no disrespect to them, they won the minnows in this tournament, but they were well worthy of that point and should have probably beat PSG. So maybe for Barcelona, for Manchester United, for PSG, having these bad results to start with in the group stage might actually, you know, give them a bit of a kick up the backside and get them going in this tournament. But who knows, Nick? I mean, there's, there were some other European giants who who did pretty well. I know Borussia Dortmund are a team that you watch closely, the sister city being Buffalo. Mm-hmm. Um, they had a great result away at Besiktas and a couple of young stars who could be in the Premier League very soon. Erling Haaland and Jude Bellingham particularly caught the eye. Uh, Bellingham just looks phenomenal. And I remember when he was when he was about to be sold and we saw the fee. And I, I think we all maybe even laughed about it a little bit because he had been in the championship with Birmingham. And mm-hmm. we just yeah. weren't sure what to make of it. And we forget that these uh, scouts out there are paid to monitor really good players. Uh, yeah. He's he's grown into his role. I think the thing with Dortmund is they're very um, anxious, not anxious, but they're, they're ready to put young players into the lineup, but they also don't jam them in there. So when, when Pulisic or Reyna was coming up, they do become regulars over time, but they'll be given a week and a half to kind of settle back and, and think about what's happened in their career. And it's it's a very, for a team that is a giant that makes the Champions League every year, there's a very, there's much we can learn about how to introduce young talent to the fold. And, um, you know, the the interesting thing here is with Bellingham and, and Holland, who have been linked with uh, Erling Holland, who have been linked with essentially every big team on earth is trying to think about where they would fit in somewhere. Um, you know, uh, Liverpool fans often try to, to try to bring up their club as the destination for either of them. And you, you kind of look at them and I'm just even thinking with Liverpool yesterday, we are we psychoanalyze and we micro analyze these teams. Uh, Liverpool was very, very good against AC Milan. <laughs> they had three minutes when they weren't good. And yet we're, we're sitting there, well, how would I fix this? How would I fix this? PSG, the way that that they struggled, you know, Messi put a ball over the net with just a few minutes to go. And you remember, it does take time for gel when there are new pieces here. It does. And, and maybe it's easy for us to, when we can think about Thomas Tuchel and even how Tottenham has started this year, to realize that um, sometimes a new coach can come in and take a while to get it going. Definitely. And Andy, particularly on Bellingham, I know you're a big fan of his. He's been linked to a move to Liverpool next summer. There are already a lot of talks in the tabloids in the UK about, you know, a big money transfer coming up for, for Bellingham. He's 18 years of age. I mean, he took that game by the scruff of the neck in Besiktas. He scored a great goal, a great assist for Erling Haaland. He just seems... I'm, not, I'm going out on the... Li- I don't want to... I don't want to be too... Do it. Do it, okay. Joe. He reminds me of Steven Gerrard. I'm okay, just going to say it. The way he runs yeah. forward, uh, he's added a bit more attacking intent to his game over the last year. Yeah. And yeah, I think he learned a lot from being, didn't play a lot for England at the Euros, but he was around that squad and that that system. And I, I think he's going to be a superstar for England and hopefully we see him in the Premier League soon. But what what do you like so much about Jude Bellingham? Uh, well, I mean, everything. He, he'll he start uh, in Qatar for England, I think. I think his, his ascent will be that rapid and that quick to the point where Gareth Southgate will look at him and say, oh, I can't not play this guy, uh, the, the, the impact that he has. And if it is a Steven Gerrard type, that, that that's one thing that I like about Bellingham so much is uh, he is so versatile at this point. And the fact that he is 18 years old, whatever club signs him, if it's this summer coming up, if it's another year down the road, uh, they can essentially make him into whatever player they want him to be. He has the tactical uh, you know, intelligence to, to operate in a lot of spar- uh, parts of the field. Uh, he's got the, the, the technical ability that's just that, that's unmatched by any player at that age. I think at any given time, there's probably one, maybe two teenagers in the world that, that have just as much raw talent as Bellingham does, and he is one of those players at this point. Liverpool does seem like the perfect spot for him to go, though, you know, because we talk about players and 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 what they do and what they bring and where it would fit best. The high energy, the high intensity, uh, the the but 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 while being very intelligent and smart with how you use that energy and intensity, because you can look at Liverpool and say, well, they just press press press, and it's a hundred miles an hour all the time. It's not exactly that. It's very quick when players are engaged in a defensive action but 
It's the understanding of when that needs to happen. And I think he is learning a lot of that at Dortmund. Dortmund is a pretty good feeding ground for Liverpool. If you look at the way the two, the two clubs kind of operate tactically uh, under their current managers or multiple managers at Dortmund. So that feels like a perfect fit. But, of course, it's going to come down to money in, in the end. As long as he gets back to the Premier League and we can see him every single week, though, I think everybody will be better off for it. And Joe, when we talk about uh, American players going abroad and what manager they're going to get, um, Bellingham with Marco Rose now, whether he were to go to uh, to Klopp, to Tuchel, to any of these guys is huge for him because if you look at the numbers underneath his success, the only thing he's missing is wisdom, right? Like he's he brings the ball forward, he completes dribbles, he gets shots, he makes key passes, he pressures, he tackles, he blocks the ball. You know, he's he's got to learn to read the game in a way that is not his fault right now because he's 18. And when he figures out sort of intercepting the ball, you know, Jamie Carragher last night said that somebody asked him to make the comparison to Gerard and they kind of expected him to blush. And his answer was, I don't know that Gerard was doing this stuff at that age. <laughs> Think about that. Wow. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And that's incredible. And I know Birmingham City got a lot of stick for retiring his number 22 jersey when he left a few years ago for Borussia Dortmund, but that's looking like a very smart decision. They obviously knew they had a gem there. And, Is it? Uh, yeah. <laughs> they knew something. They knew something special was going on with him, and he's obviously a lifelong Birmingham City fan. So I don't know if he's going to be joining them anytime soon, but he's definitely going to be joining one of the big Premier League teams. Maybe Liverpool. That seems like a very good fit for Jordan Henderson to kind of, he's coming towards the end of his career. But for Liverpool and England, that seems like a very good replacement to have Jude Bellingham coming in. So that's some of the stars who shone in the Champions League in week one. There were a lot of goals, a lot of crazy games. Obviously, Man City and Jack Grealish did great things against Leipzig. And yeah, I think Chelsea just took care of business, right? Romelu Lukaku once again uh, on the score sheet, four and four for him. Not a bad start to life back in England with Chelsea. And now we switch our attention to the US men's national team players. It was an up and down week. Let's just say that. I think it's fair to say to the American players in the Champions League, we had, you know, Jordan P. Fox were on the winner for young boys against Manchester United. What a moment that was for him. He came on at half time, caused a lot of problems. United were down to 10 men. So he had a few chances in and around the box before he uh, latched onto that loose pass by Lingard and scored the winner. Um, so that was a, a big positive, but Andy, anybody else really catch your eye? What do you think about PFOC? Because he seems to be maybe just overtaking Josh Sargent as the U.S. men's national team's main man up top. Well, he's playing regularly, so that's yeah. a start. Uh, you know, that's already a leg up on, on Sargent. We'll see if he can translate that towards any kind of international opportunity or, or form if he does get on the field regularly for the national team. But uh, raise your hand if you had Jordan Pifok as the first American goal scorer in the group stage of the Champions League this season because you look at Pulisic and Reyna and, and McKinney and even Dest, who I think scored in the Champions League last or scored a very good goal for Barcelona last season, uh, maybe in a different competition. You think all those players first, and this Jordan Pifok against Manchester United in stoppage time for the winner. I mean, it's just an incredible story, and obviously he's he's a little bit more advanced in his career. He's not quite as young as some of the the up and coming players, and so I don't think he'll get he gets lumped into you know kind of the, the the current generation. He is just a guy at a position where we're still searching for answers, and so he has an opportunity, uh, especially in the Champions League. Even if they only get six games, that's six games on a very very big. Stage stage that Greg Berhalter will no doubt see and will take note of because it's against higher competition than he's going to face the rest of the club season. So if he can show out in those games, he can absolutely make a case for uh, maybe not the starting spot, but some some significant minutes when we get into this October window because Sargent's struggling a little bit. Ricardo Pepe, he was good. He's 18 as well. So like, th th there's just a lot of youth. And if we could have a stable hand, maybe somebody who's been through a little bit in his career at that position, I, I wouldn't hate it. Nick, what about some of the other U.S. men's national team players? Obviously, some superstars in Reina, Pulisic were injured. Des was on the bench. McKenney came on as a sub. A few others struggled. Uh, John Brooks got a red card. Tyler Adams had a tough time trying to lock down Jack Grealish. What was your assessment of their situations? Because uh, it's been a busy few weeks for these American players traveling over for CONCACAF World Cup qualifying, going back to Europe, league play, then Champions League. It's tough for these young guys. Yeah, and I'm suddenly worried about, even more worried about the backs. And mm -hmm. because John Brooks was had a bad time with the U.S., he was not good 
for Wolfsburg the other day. He's been very good for them really up until last month. So maybe we can hope that, not hope, no, you don't want anyone to be hurt, but maybe there's something underneath the surface, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Because to me, he is the key, especially because uh, Greg Berhalter has kind of leaned on him to have the young guys around him to help Miles Robinson grow. So, you know, I do worry about that. I, I think just a quick note on the, on the PFOC thing, um, I, cause it relates to when we talk about these young guys and, and Ricardo Pepe that Andy mentioned, I mean, this is a guy who's talked about as potentially an AC Milan target in January. This is a huge window coming up for the United States next month. And you need your guys in fine form, but you also guys like PFOC are going to know, yeah, I'll have my chances for a while, but, this is a chance for me to seize it. There are young guys coming up. I can lay claim to this. Josh Sargent's probably going to find his footing at some point in Norwich. So this is him in the window for him to, to become the guy. And I look at Adams. I'm not worried about Tyler Adams. We might be learning that that his Swiss Army knife uh, mentality under, under Julian Nagelsmann last season really should be whittled down to playing in the center of the park because he got turned pretty well by, by Jack Grealish. Um, and I also worry a little bit to talk about that coach, about Jesse Marsh. Um, I think he's great. I think anybody would do a great job to hire him. But where is Leipzig right now? They've had him in the system for a long time. So they know him and they trust him and he's been bred for this. But uh, is the patience of a big clip, a club going to be there for him when you consider um, you know, losing big time to Bayern, replacing a club legend and Nagelsmann and now losing big time to Man City? Um, where are the expectations? Because they did not replace two very good center backs in uh, Kanate to Liverpool and Uva Makano to Bayern. Yeah, it's tough for Jesse Marsh early in the season, but they look good going forward at least. They're going to be very exciting to watch Leipzig, that's for sure. I don't think they'll face many better teams than Manchester City in the Champions League this season. But yeah, a lot going on in the Champions League for American players and coaches. We'll have you covered at Pro Soccer Talk on NBCSports.com, all the latest videos, news, analysis how to watch these games and the fixtures, our predictions as well. We like to dish those out and uh, look into the old crystal ball. There's a lot going on in European soccer at the moment, domestically and with the Champions League and Europa League and Europa Conference League all starting this week in the group stages. It's been a lot of fun, so we'll keep you covered here at Pro Soccer Talk. Hi there, I'm Rebecca Lowe, studio host for NBC's coverage of the Premier League. Don't forget to hit subscribe to watch highlights all season long and be sure to tune in for Premier League mornings every weekend at 7 a.m. Eastern. And for even more content, head over to Peacock, where we've got live games, original series and a dedicated round-the-clock Premier League channel featuring studio shows, classic matches and much more.